IPI evangelist for MYOB, who helps customers make awesome things. He also runs a number of meetups in Sydney and is overall a really sweet guy. So he's absolutely the expert we need to talk to us today about how to make the web fast with jelly snakes and raspberry twizzlers. Let's make him feel welcome. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome. Um, my name's Jack. If you know me online, you may potentially know me as Jack Skinner, quote, semicolon, dash, dash. I do get some interesting lanyards printed for conferences when I OAuth with Twitter. Um, that is a bit of fun. Um, and if you are on Twitter, please tweet me at developer Jack. I warmly invite um, corrections, questions, heckles, and embarrassing photos of me in speaking poses like this. So I'll see you after the talk, and hopefully I'll, uh, I'll beat the tweets per minute counter for the conference. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about making the web fast with jelly snakes and raspberry twizzlers. Um, why? I want to bring this back down to why we need to focus on performance and what impact that has for you and your customers. Um, so I went and did some figures and the Financial Times did a bit of an experiment where they took um, one second extra simulated page speed and they found that it was a 4.9% reduction in content consumed. An almost 5% reduction in content consumed is a really, really big change in the way your customers use your site, especially if you have advertising revenue. Uh, we know, and, and these are some US figures, we know that 30% of online sales are mobile, and yet the average site loads in almost seven seconds. 40% of your customers will leave after three seconds. That's quite a large volume of your customer base that you are losing after that third second. These are some uh, AWS figures uh, some from Amazon, and they found that a 100 millisecond improvement added 1% revenue. Um, now, these figures have also sort of been flipped to a degree, um, where they found that um, adding 100 milliseconds lost them 1% uh, revenue. So you sort of flip that, that equation around somewhat. Um, GQ relaunched their website in the US uh, last July, I think it was, and they found that an 80% reduction in load time, that they've optimized the site, had an 80% increase in traffic. And GQ has a very large business in advertising and, and content consumed. Now, they also found that the time on site went from 5.9 minutes, so almost six minutes, up to 7.8, or almost eight minutes. And so that's a phenomenal improvement to the volume of content consumed on a website. Uh, is anyone here more on the operations or networking side of, of, of tech? A few hands, wonderful. They also found that in optimizing their website here, they had um, the number of calls to server reduced by 400%. Yeah, I heard her in the audience. Um, now, ultimately, we, we go back to that sort of three seconds and you lose customers metric. They got their site down to two seconds, which I think is absolutely fantastic. 79% of dissatisfied customers will not purchase from your site again. And then that's specifically dissatisfied with performance. So if your site is slow, you're going to piss people off. And further, 44% of those will actively tell their friends. Now, when we look at the US versus uh, Aussie speeds, and I love coming over here to New Zealand because they're much faster internet, um, we know um, that the, pay the, the world's internet varies quite a lot. So if you're looking at US figures, um, you have to tune this for your local audience, whether it be... Um, local to a particular country or a region or globally, th these figures need to be adjusted for your customers. Ultimately, slow sites make me sad. And I haven't spent the last week on the road talking at conferences just to be sad about web performance. So I want to talk to you about how we're going to improve this. So I want to do a quick survey so I understand the room here. Um, how many people are sort of web native, you, you use the web quite a bit? That is hopefully everyone in the room. Okay, keep your hand up if you know how HTTP works. Okay, and what if, keep your hand up if you know HTTP well enough to write a client or a server. You're allowed to reference the RFC. <laughs> okay, so a few hands went back up again. So I saw a few hands go down, which shows that not everyone here is gonna go and, and write 
um, an implementation or contribute to an open source server package. Um, I'm going to go back to very, very foundations of HTTP and bring us up through current best practice, and then we're going to land into some performance things. Um, I have a three M's approach to performance. Measure it. If you do not know where you're starting from, you cannot reliably make improvements. And in fact, that measure is so important that it is also the second M in my 3Ms approach, but it's got a slightly larger font. Because you need to measure the progress you make when you're making performance improvements. You don't know how much of an impact you've had without measuring it a second time. And of course, measurement is so important that you'll never guess that the third M is also measure, but an even larger font. Because the web keeps changing. And you need to keep that performance monitoring in place to understand how your customers and how the ecosystem is changing as the web grows. Now, for anyone that is not familiar with HTTP, I know there are a few hands that went down quite rapidly after visiting Facebook, um, the web has a very simple request and response model. It's very much question answer. We have a request that goes out, so I'm asking in here to get the resource devjack.css, and I'm speaking HTTP 1.1. Now, along with this request is some extra headers up here in this sort of green box. And these tell me a little bit more information about what my request is. In APIs, that can be H uh, API keys and authorizations. Uh, and here I'm saying that I'm using a, a Chrome browser and I specifically want um, the developerjack.com website. Subtle website drop. Um, the response comes back in from the server and says, yes, 200 OK, I know how to respond to that. And it gives me back some more headers over here. Here it's going to tell me that I'm getting a style sheet and that I get a, an e-tag. And this is often used for um, uh, caching and other um, sort of versioning types of things. Um, but realistically, the entire web, as we know it on HTTP, operates on this question, answer, response. And there's a lot of waiting involved in that as you wait for an answer. So at the very, very foundations, the client asks for, a asks for some content. And it asks it to the cloud, and the cloud is, of course, somebody else's computer, and you never know where it is. And the cloud eventually, when it's ready, responds with an answer. So the first performance thing we introduce is a content delivery network, or a CDN, where we conceptually move the cloud a little bit closer. Now, this has the added benefit of having complexity in your application stack. For example, my side projects I like to launch up on Heroku, but keep all the assets and the static content on S3. And so anything that goes to... Um, the S3 content can go up to one origin, and anything from my application can go to a second one. And having a CDN closer to the user is a performance improvement because I can cache things on the CDN, f faster responses, and I can have a single consistent interface between all of my infrastructure. Now, minification is a bit of fun. It takes um, large files and makes them smaller while increasing the file name. Makes big, small file names bigger and big files smaller. Um, it helps remove some of the superfluous characters and data in that. Um, that means that the content we're transferring over the web is smaller. And that's important anywhere you go. The smaller the conversation, the faster you can have it. Compression takes this sort of um, size reduction a little bit further. Um, it's not usually implemented in your application, but rather in the um, trans, uh, transfer uh, process. And it's obviously sent back to the cloud. So my content, for example, is not gzipped from my origin. It's gzipped from uh, my CDN. That's also really important. And then we also have concatenation, where we combine multiple assets together into one ginormous file. And here we're taking scripts.js and dependencies.js. And then, of course, someone didn't publish it through NPM, so I've got it hard-coded, committed into my repository libs.js. And I bring them all down into one file so I don't have to have multiple conversations. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, conversations take time and there's a lot of waiting involved to get that answer. And so we now have everything.js um, and often we introduce here manifests so that we can debug and, and figure out extra things with our code. And this is all front-end performance on our websites. Now when you combine all these together, we get some kind of pipeline where we get scripts.js and dependencies.js and libs.js and we get a very large everything.js and then a slightly smaller but larger file name everything min.js. And most of us here that are involved in web development will have these automatically run using gulp or grunt or some kind of build tool for your front-end assets. And this whole pipeline is 
generally considered best practice. And that's true. The practices and processes we have developed over many years on the web just because of HTTP 1.1 and the way it models conversations and data transfer. Ultimately, though, we want to help web browsers be lazy and do less work. And so with HTTP 2, we're going to start to see a focus around reducing those conversations, reducing the amount of work that a client has to do. So what is HTTP 2? Well, it introduces a number of changes on top of HTTP 1.1. Um, and I'm only going to cover a few very small points because there's no point in me reading out an RFC. You'll all go to sleep. So we're going to focus on a couple. Um, but overall, so you get a bit of an understanding, HTTP 1 and 1.1 and were all plain text protocols. You could literally tell net to port 80 and type get devjack.css HTTP 1.1 and you could manually type out that conversation. With HTTP 2, that conversation is now binary, not plain text. So unless you've got some kind of middleman or, or application or library to do that for you, you can't really have that conversation anymore. So the tooling has to be in place to use H2. Now, it's also multiplexed over TCP. So when I had HTTP 1.1, every single question, answer, response was another TCP connection that I would open. With HTTP 2, that is now a single TCP connection per origin. So it's, it's based around host names. It also introduces uh, HPAC header compression, which is really good for uh, especially mobile clients where data transfer and, and speeds are reduced. Um, and there is a stream priority so that within all these multiplexed conversations, you can prioritize certain conversations. There's no point in loading some resources before others. Um, but for me, because HTTP 2 is new, and it was only uh, ratified as a, a formal standard early last year, we're still getting the tooling coming into various projects. For me, it's shiny. And with everything new, sometimes it's a bit of a, oh, we have to go implement that now, don't we? I want to flip that. I want to challenge you to say, HTTP 2 is fun. And here's why. Waiting is bad. We never like waiting for things. We like things to be quick and snappy. But the internet is not simple. You can't just go and turn on the tap to get data and have it immediately come through the pipes. And I struggle with this analogy sometimes because it, it can be taken too far. But for me, the internet is much more like this tap. Because when you turn it on, there's a gurgling noise and a rumbling over the hill. And then eventually, you hear some rattling and sort of a squeaky noise. And you sort of hear the water coming through the pipes and redirect it up over the hill through the garden bed, around the corner, and through the tap where it makes a splashing noise. And then finally, you get a stream of water. <laughs> the internet is much more complex than we think about it. So the time to first byte metric is a huge portion of our web performance. Here, what we have is we have a, a client requesting uh, what will be hundreds of assets, no doubt, with the modern web. And in fact, um, can anyone remember when Doom was released? That very first binary that came out? The average web page, the whole, whole payload, is now bigger than that Doom binary. <laughs> <laughs> the web's getting really big. So we've got one conversation to get index.html, and when we get index.html back, we pass the content. And the web browser then goes, aha, I need style.css. And I'm going to request style.css, and I'm going to wait for it to be returned. And then when I finally get it back, I'm going to go, aha, I need fonts, and I need JavaScript. And all of this blocking content um, really slows down the page speed. Now, when you introduce TLS or, or running your website with HTTPS, you introduce a conversational overhead. So for example, to have a secure conversation, I first have to go, hello, Sarah, you develop a jack.com. Can I trust you? Yes. Wonderful. I'll have index.html, thanks. OK. And then I have to go, hello, Sarah, you develop a jack.com. Yes. Thank you. Can I have style.css? There's a bit of an overhead to that handshake. And then, of course, I have to go for it. No, I won't do it again. <laughs> but you can see that there is this slow conversation overhead to every single request. However, because HTTP 2 is over a single TCP connection, that handshake occurs once. Because you have one handshake, 
and then multiple conversations after that. So while TLS might have been an argument to reduce performance in HTTP 1, there's now no excuse not to have security in HTTP 2. And in fact, most browsers specifically require TLS in order to, to run H2. Now, it is not a requirement in the standard. Took a lot of debating. It's not a requirement in the standard, but it's a requirement for your customers. So that's the difference. Um, and in fact, it was this particular multiplexing model that was the inspiration for this talk. Um, it was originally written after uh, a Monday night at a pub where a friend of mine said, Jack, you should submit to this conference. And I thought, yeah. And then my, my friend sort of did a bit of an Aussie tour, and then he came back to the pub, and we sat down there the following Monday, and he goes, no, no, you should really submit to this conference. And I went, uh. And then I saw this tweet. Now, Clay is a developer advocate at New Relic, and uh, I absolutely loved this moment where I saw, ha ha, HTTP2 is a really sweet topic. <laughs> so when we look at H2 and the way it models these conversations, concatenation and bringing everything together in one very big file is now an anti-pattern because it is more effective to have multiple concurrent multiplexed um, conversations than it is to have one huge file that you pick up over the internet and drop into a client's browser. Because it means you, once you've finished processing one of those elements, one of those resources, uh, you can move on and work on the next. So it, it also means that um, they're not blocking each other anymore. And if you've got different moving parts in your complex web application, each of these scripts and moving parts in your web, web page can be independently cached. So you don't have to do a complete rebuild and serve up an entirely new 10 megabyte JavaScript file. You can serve up smaller portions of that code. Now you'll notice that minification is still a, a good thing here. Okay, we still want to transfer small things, so we get rid of all the superfluous data. Um, but we, we also know that, that repetition is bad, so we can cache each individual element um, and avoid requests. So keep caching things. Keep minifying them and gzipping them. But stop lumping them all together in a huge file. Break things up and have multiple requests. Um, prediction, however, is good. If you know the client is going to do something, HTTP2 now allows you to preempt that. So with server push, if a client asks for index.html, the chances are, and I'll put money on this, they're probably going to ask for style.css. Probably. And you, you could potentially build into your application some user agent detection logic. So if they're using um, uh, links or something like that, then maybe you don't have to spit out a, a, a whole big file. But you, you have one connection overhead, one request, and then your cloud or your application can go, well, I know you want style.css, so I'm going to push it down the pipe. And when your client, your browser, has finished passing the HTML, it's going to go, I need style.css. Oh, no, wait, it's okay, I've got it now. And you reduce that overhead and that time to first byte. Now, of course, you can then cascade this. So, of course, you're going to want Comic Sans, are you not? No? What's everyone got ag against Comic Sans? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so we can see this to start to cascade from small amounts of overhead that we've reduced in the conversation and then removing all the superfluous questions. That's where our performance is coming from. Now, this is great for web pages. We've, we've spoken about a very, very simple web page model. But I'm an API evangelist, and I have a lot of thoughts and, and things to say about APIs. I won't go into them too deep. Um, here is uh, Apple, uh, Android's uh, Play Store. And you can see up the top there, we've got uh, menus. We've got various categories, and then we've got some albums, and some kind of leaderboard graphic. And in the current web model with H1, and 1.1, I should say, 
for a, from a web performance standpoint, the chances are we're going to have a, a, a JSON endpoint that couples all of that data together. It's complicating things. For me, though, as an API evangelist and helping developers design and implement really clean, sleek APIs, these are completely different resources from completely different endpoints. So with HTTP2, we have the ability to have one very small get request on, on the app's index endpoint and then potentially push down the subsequent resources. So H2 is now going to enable us to properly isolate and represent our resources independently without having to design an API specifically for types of clients. I hate seeing APIs that are built just for mobile because there are so many other data clients out there. Yesterday's practices, many of them are now today's anti-patterns with HTTP2. But H2 is an upgrade, so you still need to support both H1 and H2. And we are still exploring what best practice really means for H2. But for me, it really brings the stack together. Are there any um, sort of more design and, and front-end developers in the room? A couple of folks up towards the back, wonderful. You still have a really, really crucial role to play in web performance because we need small resources, compressed images. There's a whole conversation around that that is critical to your, your participation in this. How many people he here are front-end engineers and, and work with JavaScript? It's two hands up the back, awesome. You still have a really, really crucial role to play minification, splitting up your, your front-end assets. Who hears more in network and, and um, infrastructure? Few more hands going up, wonderful. So you've still got a role to play. H2 needs uh, support, and, and uh, various suppliers and vendors are bringing out that support day by day. Um, it also changes the TCP model. Right? So if you, there's a couple of blogs that have come out in the last three months about the impact that's had for companies enabling H2. And who here is more an application developer? Quite a few more hands. Okay, you have a crucial role to play because you're designing these APIs and these endpoints and these interactions. So it's bringing the stack back together as, as, um, as developers and engineers where you can no longer say, oh, that's Ops' problem. Catch! You've got to work together with H2. So what are we going to do about it? We've got this brand new technology. It's going to enable so many awesome APIs and, and interactions. Well, 76% of browsers currently support H2 natively. This came from uh, Can I Use. It's an amazing uh, tool to track um, feature uptake. Now, I, I'm, I messed with this number a little bit. It's actually 70% with complete compatibility and a further 6% of partial compatibility. So it might have H2 support, but it may not necessarily have something like uh, push. And that's the case for uh, Nginx, for example, needs a separate module in there, so, so same with clients. Um, now, who actually supports it? Um, so you've got Cloudflare, you've got MaxCDN, but also, as of three days ago, CloudFront. So approximately 60 minutes ago, I logged into my uh, CloudFront distribution for developerjack.com, and I enabled H2. And the um, propagation went out, and it was updated, and now, This is my website. So we still have slow parts of the web. DNS took quite a while to, to, to look up, but I only need that once. The time to first byte was still quite large because I'm not pushing the content down the wire. However, subsequent calls was literally just waiting in a tiny resource. It wasn't this huge, big file waiting to download. Uh, this here was my style.css, actually, I think. Really, really lightweight request. And you can actually see, and I, I didn't manage to copy it in in time, but you can see usually what happens with HTTP 1 is you'll make one request, and then you'll make another request, and another request, and another request, and it kind of cascades and blocks a bit. But with H2, you'll have one initial request over here, and then they'll all cascade right next to each other. So if you load up developerjack.com in your browser, it does now support H2. And if you go load up Google Chrome's uh, developer tools, network tab, um, enable the network inspection, you'll see that cascading really quick requests. Um, now the interesting thing here is I actually got a reduction in my page speed metrics because I'm not properly using H2. 
was changing the way I'm having that conversation. So there's still work for me to do. I can't just flick a switch. But that was my personal sight. Others have experienced very different metrics. That's the measurement portion. So Simpler is a startup in Sydney, and they enabled HTTP2 and found it was 400% faster across 500 page elements. Um, can I get a quick show of hands? Who's familiar with web components in Polymer as JavaScript? OK, a few folks. For those of you that aren't, it's a, a brand new approach to JavaScript where instead of having your page and then jQuery.min.js, you've got individual small components. So the heading might be an element, the nav bar might be an element, the ad block might be an element, and they're individual components. Simpler is a startup whose goal is to replace the CMS. It completely change the way you model and, and build websites. So think of it as HTML5 content editable, where you can click into the, the element, edit it. It makes the JavaScript calls to the sort of content store in the web and brings it back. And so you actually edit and build your web page exactly as it looks to a customer. But of course, that has a huge overhead because you're no longer downloading one piece of JavaScript and one piece of content. You're downloading hundreds of pieces of content for your web page. Completely changes the way that, that occurs. So they really depend on HTTP2 to have a viable business model. So they did some metrics. I, I bought them a whiskey uh, and many, many coffees. And they found that for their particular test, H1 was loaded in 42 seconds. I think you've probably lost more than 30% of your customers after 42 seconds. Um, now, we were running a big metric to see how far we could push the technology. So we enabled H2 and got it down to 15 seconds. And then we added the CDN. We moved the cloud a little bit closer to the customer. There's your cloud, sir. And we found that the performance was down to 9 seconds. Now, it's not an ideal performance. There's a lot of work to do there. But we were pushing a large number of connections. So really trying to, to see where this technology goes. And in fact, this, this was the graph. Now, there's a couple of anomalies, as you can see. We were running this on local environments, so we had other processes coming into play and, and locking things up. There's a bit of a drop-off at the end there that we want to explore and, and what that actually was for H2. Um, but overall, the blue line, which is H2, was much faster per, per more connections. So the more connections you have, the more performant H2 becomes. HTTP2 is a brand new way to think. It's binary. It's a completely new paradigm. It's a completely new way to architect your APIs and think about your resources. But we are still only just scratching the surface of what H2 can do for our applications and our clients. So there's the concept of a weight of a resource. There is no point in me pushing Comic Sans as a font before you've received index.html. That's useless. So we can prioritize certain streams, certain resources to be pushed down an H2 connection. Um, HPAC, so it's a header compression, but we know there are security implications with uh, the compression. So there's a, a, a write-up recently about an HPAC bomb where you can essentially compress something and, uh, and design it in such a way that when it is unzipped, it's a huge multi-megabyte file. And if you do that enough on, on enough connections, you can exhaust volumes of memory on the server. So there's still security implications that we need to explore. Um, what else do I have here? Uh, slow reads. So if you intentionally still read something slowly and, and uh, accumulate a large volume of open connections, same as H1, still in H2. So there's still things we need to explore on how we do on a TCP level. Um, and because we have these sort of dependency graphs on what resource to go first, especially when you're getting to push manifests and what resources map to where, you sort of get to this dependency cycle risk. So we still need to Think about the way we model our communication. It's not just open slather, go, go performance things. Um, WebSockets. Who is using WebSockets in their application? Awesome. WebSockets still have a role to play. H2 is all about that initial load, that initial first conversation to get content to your client. WebSockets that are kept open over a long period of time are fantastic for that ongoing communication, right? those sort of annoying chat pop-ups that irritate me on sales websites. So I want to challenge you. With every change you make, measure the impact. Go back to that 3Ms approach. I want you to measure it. If you can take two things away from this talk, I'd like you to be the performance improvement you want to experience. Make it personal, because you will immediately see the impact you have for your customers. 
And because it's HTTP2, because it's new and fun, I want you to try something new. Because we are all still learning. H2 is great fun, and I've been making and breaking code with H2. So I want you to go and explore, and then share what you learn back with the rest of us. Because without it, we can't grow HTTP2 as a community. My friends, that has been Making the Web Fast with Jelly Snakes and Raspberry Twizzlers. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes for questions. And I will try and answer them to my best of my ability. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm a big fan of REST APIs. And As am I. Yeah, great. And I'm just wondering what some of the implications for the people who are designing the REST APIs, which never touch a browser, for example, right? Mm -hmm. It's all just code that's talking to other code. Absolutely. Um, um, so there's two key um, changes, I think, that we need to model and, and acknowledge as H2 moves forward as a technology. The first is understanding our clients. So for me at MYOB, I'm working with a community of about 4,000, a bit over that now, um, developers who've come from years of working with relational databases, on-prem, reach into ODBC drivers, and so it's an education factor. With our APIs, I can't just go, use the API, off you go. There's an onboarding experience. There's a, a set of knowledge in the community you have to model. So we aren't rolling out HTTP2 tomorrow. Well, I, Amazon only just got it into their stack. So you have to understand your developers' needs and, and how they are going to uh, consume your content. The second is then how you model that content. So for example, uh, let's take an invoice, for example. An invoice has all sorts of line items on it. But for an index of uh, invoice resources, you don't necessarily want to push that down the pipe. From an accounting standpoint, there's a lot of background data to generate all of that. And so if that data is in memory, because you've had to calculate the total of the invoice for the index, our applications can become much more performant because we can push the full invoice resource down and not have to make that request in 50 milliseconds time from the database. So it's not just modeling the communication we have with our customers, it's modeling how we use data within our applications. And if we know the customer's going to want it, push it. Thank you. Uh, yes? Hey, um, I'm really curious about this from the Django -y Python side of things. And mm -hmm. I see that we've got Marcus in the room. And what I'm kind of wondering is, does H2 break WSGI? Like, to take advantage of some of these push things, to take mm -hmm. advantage of some of these uh, multiplexing things, do we have to rethink how the Django, the Python code layer, talks to the uh, reverse proxy, the web server, the Nginx, the whatever? Good question. Short answer is I don't know. The slightly longer answer is I don't know, let's find out over a whiskey. And the third answer there is um, I suspect not, because, for example, I come from a PHP background. I'll get to that. Um, and it changes the way those languages interact with the web server as well. So especially around the memory management, you still got to make those requests. But, but Apache and Nginx handle the H2 conversation. So there might be small amounts that we need to do. Do we have an answer on the, does it break it? No, I, I can repeat back the answer. Uh, because Apache will terminate the H2 connection and you have that clear separation with, with, with your web app through that WSGI API. There's nothing in the WSGI API about push. Yep. So you lose that ability. Um, so well, yeah, so uh, the other thing there is that the RFC doesn't say push has to be implemented. It's a may push. So as long as you know how to handle and ignore, which is how most clients can support it, you, you can use it then by the sounds of it. Was there another answer? Question. Question. Wonderful. Um, can you do the server push stuff with static pages? So I don't know. I ha yeah. Yep, you absolutely can. However, it becomes a little bit more complicated. So we add a header, and we say that this is a, a rel of uh, preload, and then the sort of middle agent, such as your CDN, can, can read those, and then preload content. So there's, there's a whole bunch you can do in headers about DNS prefetching and content preloading and things like that. You can send a header with your content and say, yes, preload style.css. And then other parts of the stack implement that for you. So out of the box, no, but the stack does support it once you align your various chess pieces to make it happen. 
Uh, I can find some resources and we can have a chat about it over a whiskey. Wonderful. Do we have time for more questions? Just one. Just one more question. Wonderful. Up, up the back here. Hi there. I've been doing a bit of. Yeah. That's on. Yep. I've been doing a bit of um, performance and load testing with um, Locust and Python and so forth. Are there any implications in HTTP two for um, changing the the strategies that we use for load testing? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know. I've not delved into that that much my, myself. I boil it back down to TCP. We're really talking about conversations. What transfers over that? It's up to your application. So TCP, keep keep that load testing happening. For HTTP, it's going to depend on your application stack um, and how you're doing various scale operations. So let's find out. Let's find out. And and when you do discover it, write a blog post. Let me know, and we can let the community know. Wonderful. Is that the last last question? I have one more question. Very quickly, yes. Are you willing to take questions in the hallway track? I absolutely am. I'm also happy to take them on Twitter. Okay, because that's all the time we have. Thank so you very much. Thank you very much.